Grace and peace to you from Onalaska First United Methodist Church. You're listening to our podcast. We hope you enjoy. Well, our third reading today comes from the Gospel of John, and we're going to be in the 14th chapter today, verses 23 through 29. Listen to what this says. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for this opportunity to study your word and to talk about it. And I pray that as I do this, that your word might be proclaimed through me, or perhaps in spite of me. Amen. Amen. So, uh, we are kind of at this interesting point, right? Uh, We are moving from the Easter season. You know, the church functions on these seasons that we have. Uh, And we're, we're, we're moving from the Easter season into Pentecost. And Pentecost lasts for two Sundays, and then we'll move into what's called ordinary time, and we'll change the banners to green, and I'll wear a green stole. Actually, I think I'm probably going to take the robe off for summer, if that's okay, because it gets hot. But green just represents growth, and so it's just a time of growth for the church. But, but right now, we're still in the Easter season, and so here we are. We're in the Gospel of John, and uh, I don't know if you've ever experienced this or not, but, but I kind of have a love-hate relationship with John because sometimes the Gospel of John just gets really, really hard to understand. Uh, for instance, this passage that I just read to you, very short passage, but Jesus just kind of seems to be hopping from topic to topic. I, I picked out four things that he said here. He's talking about love and obedience. Then he moves from that to the coming of the Holy Spirit called the Advocate. Then he quickly moves from that to uh, giving us peace and telling us not to be afraid. And then he says uh, that he's going away and he's coming back and going away is a good thing. And so it's just like he's just kind of quickly jumping in in each verse. He's on a new topic. And so that tends to get a little confusing for me. Uh, and, And this snippet that I just read to you comes from a much larger section called the Farewell Discourse. The Farewell Discourse is like three chapters long, and it ends with a prayer, a beautiful prayer that Jesus prays. But it's basically Jesus leaving his last instructions to the disciples before he dies, before he dies on the cross. He knows what's about to happen, and so he wants to tell them all of these things. And so we just read just a tiny section of that. And so... It's kind of strange, perhaps, that we are still in the Easter season, which celebrates the resurrection of Jesus, but we're reading a passage that is before the crucifixion and its last instructions and details for the disciples. And Jesus is kind of jumping from topic to topic. So you may be wondering, well, what does this passage have to do? Why is it appropriate for us? The cool thing about John, I said it's a love-hate relationship for me, because the cool thing about John is everything is intentional in the Gospel of John. Everything means something. 
John was a very smart guy when he put this together. And so if you dig deep enough, you start to see the connections between the things that we read about in the gospel. And so what may seem random at times actually has great meaning and great connection. And so what I would like to talk about today is how I think these four ideas that Jesus presents in rapid succession, how they're connected, and why it's appropriate for us to be reading the farewell discourse before the crucifixion during the Easter season. That's what I'd like to accomplish today. Now, I'm just going to give you a, a one quick connector, three words. This, this is... Everything that I'm about to say is based on these these three words. You ready? Relationship with God. Relationship with God. Everything that I think this is all dealing with is relationship with God. So keep that in the back of your mind. Now, I don't know about you. when, When I first read a passage, there's usually something that jumps out to me or something that sticks with me, or something that I wonder. And perhaps that's like that for you, and maybe it's one of the four things that I mentioned. For me, the first thing that stuck out was the very first words of Jesus. First thing that stuck out to me was Jesus saying, he said, those who love me obey me, and those who don't love me don't obey me. Well, I I couldn't get past that. Because I don't know about you, Uh, but I don't obey Jesus 100% of the time. In fact, I don't know that I obey Jesus 50% of the time. But yet, I know that I love Jesus. And so I'm confused by this thought. What is he talking about here? But then I remembered that John wrote a couple of other letters, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation too. But in 1 John, chapter 4, he kind of expands on this a little bit more, and I remembered it. Now, before I read this to you, I want to ask you a question. If you notice, this, the, the title of my sermon is, The Opposite of Love is Blank. How would you fill in that blank? Hate. Okay, so hate is probably the number one answer that we would get. I've also seen it said that indifference is the opposite of love if you just don't care about somebody. But John says in 1 John 4 that the opposite of love is fear. Fear. Listen to what he says. 1 John 4, 18 and 19. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment the one who fears is not made perfect in love we love because he first loved us in other words if we find that we fear God and this is Not the kind of fear that I think the Old Testament talks about when it says that fear is the beginning of wisdom or those who fear God are blessed. That's kind of a a respect for God, an understanding, and I think that's appropriate. God is God and we are not God, and so you should keep that in mind at all times. But this this is the kind of fear John is talking about here, like fear of God, fear of God's punishment, or fear of whether God is trustworthy or not. Is God a good God? That's the fear we're talking about here. And if you are in that place, when you approach God, or as you approach God, that means you have not been made perfect in love. Fear is the other side of the coin to love. There are areas... For all of us, I think, in which we have not fully entered into that kind of a relationship with God. Areas in which we do not fully trust in God. I thought about Adam and Eve. What was the first thing Adam and Eve did when they 
sinned. You remember? They went and hid. And when God went looking for them, what did they say? We hid because we were afraid. This is the first time they experienced fear. They had never experienced fear with God before. They walked with God in the cool of the garden. But now all of a sudden they're afraid. But see, those who are able to give up that fear and come to know God as a good God and come to know God as not a God who punishes out of anger but disciplines in love and guides us in love, well, that means that we are moving from fear to love in our relationship with God. So if you take that and filter that back through then what Jesus is saying, those who love me will obey me, and those who don't love me won't obey me. He's not setting up some type of a uh, command here where he's saying that if you love me, you will obey me. What he's saying is if you find there are areas that you're not obeying me, it means you still have fear in you. That's deep. But if we can give up that fear, not the respect, but if we can come to a place where we trust God and we know God is a good God, then he says this awesome thing, the Father and I will come and make our home within you. Now hold on to this thought because Jesus is going to come back to this, but He moves quickly from love and obedience to this idea of the Holy Spirit. He says, the Holy Spirit, my Father, will send in my name, and he will teach you or she will teach you. The Holy Spirit is, uh, pneuma is a a gender neutral term, so it's really weird to say he or she. But, But the Holy Spirit will come and teach you all things and remind you of everything that Jesus has said. And he calls the Holy Spirit our advocate. Our advocate. Now this is like a like a legal term here, like one who works on one's behalf. If you went before a judge and you had a lawyer representing you, the lawyer is your advocate. The Holy Spirit is our advocate in this sense, working on our behalf and rooting for us. And in this one verse, we see the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all present, coming to us and working to remove our fear and to gain our trust so that we might obey the words of Jesus. Now, I just want to pause here for just a second because I came across something that blew me away. I told you everything in John means something, and it usually means more than one thing. It's got two or three meanings. But I came across a a commentary that my New Testament professor, Dr. Jamie Clark Souls, she brought up. I thought this was just amazing. Jesus is saying, if you love me, you will obey my commands. In the Gospel of John, Jesus gives one command. One command in the entire gospel. He says it twice. He says it in the chapter before this. And he says it once in the chapter after this. Guess what the command is? Love each other as I have loved you. For this is how the world will know you are my disciples. This is the command that Jesus gives us. It's just a freebie. That's just a side note. I just thought that was amazing. So then Jesus moves from the Holy Spirit, again, just rapid fire ideas, moves from the Holy Spirit to tackle the fear portion head on. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Now, you may have heard this verse before because this verse is typically read at a funeral or memorial service, which is very appropriate because Jesus is about to die and he's trying to comfort his disciples, right? But I think there might be, again, it's the Gospel of John, there's a little bit more, there's some deeper sense to this. And I was thinking about this. He says, 
I give to you not as the world gives. I'm giving you peace not as the world gives you peace. Now, how does the world give us peace? At this point in Roman history, if you're a history buff, you will know that right about the time of Jesus, Rome entered into a long period called the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. And for several Caesars, after Caesar Augustus, who was Caesar at the time that Jesus was around, Caesars after that, no wars, they weren't involved in any wars, there were no conflicts, it was just peace. The Pax Romana, it's famous. The problem is that the way that Rome achieved this peace was through sheer force. Caesar had the power. As Rome expands, they just step into your community they plant their flag, and they say, this is now Rome's territory. And if you don't like it, you can die or you can get out. Peace. There you go. Right? You guys are laughing. Because, because it's comical. Because it's not really peace. To become Roman in the face of two options, submit or die, well, that's not true peace. And so while I do think that Jesus is trying to calm the fears of his disciples before he dies, I think a deeper sense is he is saying, God's peace is not like Caesar's peace. God doesn't force allegiance. God earns it through loving us first and forgiving us even when we haven't asked for it. That's the kind of peace that God brings and that Jesus leaves to us. Do not fear. God is on your side. And then Jesus quickly moves from that to one final thought. And he tells them, I'm telling you that I am going away, but I am coming to you. And this is kind of a weird turn of phrase. I'm leaving, but I'm also coming to you. And I think that what he's saying here is that I'm leaving you in the sense that you are used to having me around, in this visible sense. But I'm not leaving you. I will be right here with you. And I will be with you Through the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, the Father and I will come and make our home in you. And earlier he said, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. And this is why I think that this passage is appropriate during the Easter season. Because while Jesus may not be among us in the same sense that he was with the disciples... We believe that Jesus is present among us. In fact, we talked several weeks ago about all the ways that Jesus comes to us in the Eucharist, in the preaching of the Word, in the gathering of the church, in baptism. Jesus is with us now. And so perhaps now you can see that maybe Jesus wasn't leaving fragmented thoughts as though he couldn't quite decide what to tell the disciples and he was running out of time and so he was just spitting out ideas verse after verse. But perhaps he was leaving one single thought. And it wasn't just to the disciples, but it was to all of us who would not have the luxury of meeting Jesus face to face as they had. Us who would hear about Jesus through the scriptures and through the church. And here's the single thought that I think Jesus is leaving us. You ready for this? God loves us more than we can know. And God is working on our behalf to remove our fear so that we might love him in return 
by loving each other the way he has loved us. Let me say that again. God loves us more than we can know and is working on our behalf to remove our fear so that we might love him in return by loving each other the way he has loved us. That's a deep thought. This week I was, sometimes I just have to get up and just kind of walk around as I'm thinking about things and just trying to listen to what God might be telling me or what direction I'm supposed to go in taking the sermon. I was walking through the fellowship hall and we have this bookcase, this book rack there. Have you seen that? It's take one, leave one kind of deal. It's just a book exchange. And I look over and on the shelf is a book called Love with a Chance of Drowning. Who left this book? Nobody knows? So many mystery. I was really intrigued by this, uh, just by the title of the book, and so I just just went over and picked it up and started kind of thumbing through it. Then I took it home and I started reading it. This is a true story about a lady from Australia, and she... um, decided she was going to move to the United States. She moved to San Francisco, and her plan was just to stay in San Francisco for one year and then go back to Australia. And her parents said, hey, you got our blessing, just two rules, don't fall in love with an American and make sure you come back home. And she said, no problem. I, I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to go and work in San Francisco, and that's it. Well, guess what? She fell in love. But the guy wasn't from America, he was from, uh, he was Argentinian, and so she said, okay, I'm still keeping my promise to my parents. But this guy was a sailor. He was uh, like a, like a, not like a, he was like, like he had a sailboat, and for years he had been planning this trip to sail around the world, and so he had been working on his little boat, and he had been gathering up supplies and all that stuff. And uh, she finds that she's madly in love with him, which is great. And she really would like to stay with him. The problem is she is deathly afraid of the ocean. As a kid, she grew up watching Jaws and some of those other movies, and she just had this irrational fear of the ocean. She said, there's nothing good in the ocean. It's creepy, crawly stuff with teeth. And so she doesn't even go swimming in the ocean. She just stays away from the ocean. And here this guy that she's fallen in love with is getting ready to set sail, and she's got a decision to make. Listen to what she says leading up to that moment. She said, this is my own mistake. I pursued a dreamer because I was attracted to his free spirit and unique vision. To take my rare wild bird and stick him in a cage for admiring isn't an option. It would kill his soul. In order to keep him as he is, there is only one option. I have to tuck myself under the folds of his wing and soar into oblivion with him. And I thought, my gosh, how beautiful is that? Because that's what Jesus is saying in this God desires to fold us under his wing and is asking us to trust him enough to do that so that we might soar into oblivion with him. And that oblivion is his love. The opposite of love is fear. God wants us to trust him at every turn. Now you can spend the rest of your life thinking about what that means exactly. And all the ways that we are afraid. And what it means in those places and times that we don't obey. And how that's attached to our fear. You can spend the rest of your life thinking about that. But today, I just want you to know and to hear that God knows about our fears and God is actively working to
to remove those and to draw us deeper into relationship with him so that we can live into the fullness of God's love, which in turn gives us the ability to love others in the same way. And wouldn't the world be a beautiful place if we could all achieve that? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may it be so. Amen.